Mahon 4, a jigsaw, is pieced together some 40 years on to reveal the secret history of the death of a Democrat. Jan Masaryk was my great-great-uncle. He was found dead in the courtyard of the Chernin Palace on March 10, 1948. The two workmen who discovered his broken body alerted the world to a mystery that remains unsolved to this day. Thousands turned out to mourn a favorite son. Jan Masaryk had been Czechoslovakia's foreign minister for nearly six years. Rumors that he was murdered spread throughout Prague. Only two weeks before, the communists had seized power. Their official verdict was suicide. Jan's death was a turning point for Europe. East and West were now divided by the Cold War. Any hope of compromise was laid to rest with him. My name is Thomas Kotick. My family and I live in New York. Both my parents are Czech. My mother is a Masaryk. I am returning to Prague to begin a search into the death of my great-great-uncle. Today, the face of Europe has changed. I can now ask the questions that have haunted my family and Czechoslovakia for more than 40 years. I decided to start the investigation by turning to my relatives for advice. How old is that? Circa 30. I needed to find out about the private side of Jan Masaryk. Two people who were very close to him are my grandmother, Herberta Masarykova, and her sister, Anna. I think. <laughs> and all the tea. My brother Jan and I were both curious to hear what they remembered. Mm -hmm. He was always very elegant, very good looking, and uh, without really trying, he just was <laughs> like it. But he liked to be like it, too, because it was his nature. And I don't think he would have done a thing like, like that, you know, to, to reveal himself. And certainly his, his natural uh, psychological way of thinking wouldn't let him jump about in pyjamas. He was not that kind. Of course, we don't know. He was not forced to it. We don't know. Mm -hmm. He had a good, absolutely good heart. That like a small child that is, is still innocent. He had a really very good life. That's why probably his life was not so happy, because it's... Heart was sometimes childish. He was very clever, and in the meantime, he he just make jokes, but the jokes were to 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 make people happy.
With Czechoslovakia's new freedom, archive film that was censored for decades has now resurfaced. This is the first time I've seen early footage of the Masryks together. I'd been told by Anna and Herberta how close they were to their grandfather, Thomas Gehrig Masaryk, the founder of modern Czechoslovakia. Greatly respected by his people, Thomas Masaryk made the country a model democracy, unique in Central Europe. His son valued freedom from an early age. Jan's mother was American. English was his second language. He spent many years in New York and London, where he was thought of as a fun-loving bachelor. Thomas Musrick died in 1937. Jan, now a diplomat in London, had new responsibilities. He became a spokesman for his father's ideals. As you know, he was... Uh passionately, a passionate believer in liberty of the individual, liberty of the human soul in politics, in ethics, in religion. And that democracy, real democracy, was his life struggle and his life success and his life ideal. With Thomas Masaryk's death, his foreign minister, Edward Benesch, became president. Already a close friend, Jan promised his loyalty to Benesch. Though different in temperament, their relationship was to survive Czechoslovakia's darkest years. In 1938, Hitler seized the German-speaking territories in Czechoslovakia with the consent of the Western powers. Though Hitler was welcomed by the German minority there, to the Czechs it was a betrayal of their nation. Jan Masaryk voiced their outrage. I'm coming on behalf of the European Democrats, of no government, no denomination, no frontiers. And I say to you that if it is for peace that my country has been butchered up in this unprecedented manner, I am glad of it. If it isn't, may God have mercy on our soul. Six months later, the Germans marched into Prague. Jan was exiled to England with President Benesch. From there, he made weekly radio broadcasts to his occupied nation. Jan Masaryk became their voice of hope as he campaigned for his countrymen in London. Well, you people, you proud, free, not storage as I see, people of Bermondsey, and we, proud and free representative of the past freedom of Czechoslovakia, and may it please God of next freedom of Czechoslovakia, I want us together to resolve that we're going to see this thing through to the bitter end. At Hrachani Castle, there is one person I wanted to visit still active in politics. Now a presidential advisor, he spent many hours with Jan Masaryk preparing his London broadcasts. He knew exactly how to address uh, the listeners in an occupied country under terrible conditions. Uh, I remember vividly that uh, uh, he was actually basically a sad man. He wasn't a clown. Uh, he uh, he usually played the clown. I mean, he was, he was acting more in the clown than he was. He was, a, as, as, as very often people who are extrovert are rather introvert people, sad. Uh. In England, Jan and the exiled government made careful plans for a post-war democracy. He was now foreign minister. Their aims were determined by Czechoslovakia's position in Central Europe. They had to maintain a balance between the Soviet Union and the West. At home, there was to be a coalition government. I learned from a former party member about the discussions held with communists in London. The political system agreed upon by all part, all political parties for Czechoslovakia was a mirror image of the East-West Grand alliance uh, because it 
it was built on the preposition that the, this alliance will endure. So that those who were uh, partisans of the Western philosophy and the partisans of the Eastern philosophy should, in alliance, govern this country. Already, Czechoslovakia was being drawn to the East. In 1943, a treaty of cooperation was negotiated with Stalin. President Benes was assured that there would be no Soviet interference in Czechoslovakia's internal affairs. Benes certainly, Masaryk much less, believed that the Russians will play the game of, uh, you know, of uh, peaceful, uh, friendly cooperation. And Stalin, to the last minute, promised this. This must be when he comes back to Prague after the war. In 45. When Jan returned from exile, he received a hero's welcome. I could see by my grandmother's reaction how relieved everyone was to have Jan home. <laughs> Republika skutečně se uvede do chodu. Neprostě, neříkejte mě, abych dál povídal, abych se rozbrečel. Jsem rád, že jsem doma. A parliamentary democracy seems secure. In the 1946 elections, the communists gained a majority. Jan Masaryk was not a member of any party and remained foreign minister. Aby pracující lid a především dějnická cída Clement Gottwald, the Communist Party leader, now became Prime Minister. Přitom ovšem nebylo tajemstvím, že Masaryk právě, a Gottwald to taky tak zdůvodňoval, že Masaryk je ne, nestr, nestranický politik právě proto, že představuje Západ v té vládě. Takže a on ty styky se Západem měl velice rozvinutý a on neustále věřil a to byla, já si myslím, že to byla jeho víra, jeho touha, a že dojde k nějakému vyrovnání mezi tím východem a západem, že nedojde k tomu konfliktu. Konflikt came in 1947. Jan and the Czechoslovak government unanimously agreed to accept the United States offer of economic aid under the Marshall Plan. But they were immediately summoned to Moscow, where Stalin made it clear for Czechoslovakia to accept Western aid would not be tolerated. His promise of non-intervention was broken. Jan could no longer ignore Soviet ambitions. He said, Stalin told us this was a, a question of friendship. And I think I'm quoting uh, word for word. Uh, he could have also told us, either you dance as I whistle, or you will feel my biceps. As the delegation was entertained at Moscow's Dynamo Stadium, the lines were drawn. Gottwald, who had spent the war in Moscow, accepted Stalin's orders without question. Jan, friend of the West, was left out in the cold. From then on, his relationship with the communist leaders of both countries deteriorated. That was for the first time a real, open, quite clear dictate. And that's why Masary, when he returned, said, I went to Moscow as foreign minister and coming back as a servant. This trip to Moscow was the end of Jan's dream. Cooperation between the East and Western powers was no longer possible. Jan was now treated as a pawn of Stalin. I discovered how Soviet Foreign Minister Molotov conveyed orders to him at the United Nations. He told me once, Molotov is always sending me little pieces of papers with his remarks, with his uh, orders, really. I'm collecting them. One never knows when they can be useful. 
but uh, whenever I get such a such a note, I feel a little bit like the little dog, uh, the the record of his master's voice, and sometimes. I'm praying uh, that my master's voice would be a little more humane. Before coming to Prague, I had looked at the United Nations records from this period concerning Jan. To my brother and me, the Soviet duplicity seemed blatant. Molotov and the whole Soviet delegation, including the Ukraine Soviet Republic, said flatly that how dare anyone accuse the Soviet Union of doing something like that. It is a stated policy of the Soviet Union that it would never meddle in the internal affairs of another nation. So you have, mm -hmm. you have on the one hand, people saying, well, Zorin and Molotov were telling Jan what to do. And on the other hand, you have the, at the UN, the Soviets flatly denying that they would ever do something like that. So it's, a, it's two separate events, but it's still... We now know that in 1947, Stalin began to expand his power in Czechoslovakia. The communists feared losing control in the next elections. Stalin ordered his agents to step up the infiltration of the government and, more importantly, the police. But a to v tom smyslu, že najednou dává jakési pokyny nebo jakési směrnice nebo vyjadřuje jakési přání, co by bylo dobré udělat. A v tomhle tom smyslu tedy se ta role mění a ta bezpečnost se, ta, ta, ta role ty sovětské, bez, sovětské bezpečnosti se rozšiřuje. Důležité je, že někteří vedoucí funkcionáři z pravodajských služeb v Československu patřili, měli velmi blízko k sovětské spravodajské služby. In November 1947, an attempt was made to assassinate Nan Musarek and two other non-communist ministers. At first, the security services tried to cover it up, but it was soon exposed as a local communist plot. Actions against non-communists were stepped up. There is one man who knew these tactics well. He headed the ministry which imprisoned my grandfather and thousands with him. Now seriously ill, former interior minister Rudolf Barak remembers how the state kept a close eye on Masaryk. Bezpečák. A samozřejmě, když někam jel, tak měla, měl, měla i republika zájem, aby, aby to bylo v pořádku, aby se v pořádku vrátil, aby na ně nebyla dělaná nějaký nátlak cizích lidí a tak dále. Takže on nebyl, sle, nebyl sledovaný jako odposlechem, on byl sledovaný osobně jako. jako jako očko. Jednou se mě velící důstojník náš, náš dotazoval, že jestli, jak to, jestli můžu jim hlásit, s kým pan ministr mluvil a kde, kde jsme byli a s kým se tam setkal. Já jsem ovšem tu službu odepřel s tím, že nejsem kontrarozvědčík, ale ochrana pana ministra, že to je moje povinnost a tamto ostatní, že k mým povinnostem nepatří. Jan's colleagues were now feeling the pressure. His friends abroad could see the situation getting worse. On his final trip to the West in late 1947, they urged him to stay. I tried to persuade him not to return. He explained to me that he could not leave Benesh alone under these circumstances. He also said that uh, there were other friends of his, not only in New York, but in London, who were trying to do the same as I did, and he would tell them the same thing, that he had to return. Exactly 
what he thought he could achieve on returning, I don't know. But uh, he was in utter despair, and uh, it may well have been that he wanted to die on Czech soil. Crisis came in February 1948. Jan Maastricht watched on as 12 cabinet ministers resigned to protest against communists taking over the police. Democratically, a parliamentary, on the short national front. Gottwald seized the opportunity. As the party organized huge rallies in support of a new government, President Benes was forced to accept their resignations. He had lost control of the government. Gottwald, now in command, invited Jan Masaryk to stay on as foreign minister. Masaryk uh, was needed by all sides, but by the communists also, because he was so tremendously popular. He was a member of the government, which at the various times was not so popular because of laws as it is usual. So uh, Masaryk gave to it a certain elegance. He was different. And the communists knew that this is good for everybody. As support for the coup spread, Jan's dilemma deepened. He felt the responsibility to his people and an obligation to remain with President Benes. He decided to stay on in the government, giving Gottwald the credibility of the Masaryk name. Friends abroad were shocked. Uh, he was to rush extent a broken person after he had realized that uh, he couldn't really help anyone anymore and uh, that he himself was just a figurehead that the communists have uh, been using his presence in the government more or less as a fig leaf And he saw no way out of it. With armed militia on the streets, the communists set up action committees in every government department. Those who resisted the party line were removed. Jan Masaryk was powerless to stop these purges, even at the foreign ministry. Tam už vlastně Masaryk neměl schopnost, možnost někoho zachránit. A Masaryk velmi těžce nes. A myslím, že to byl jeden z jeho důvodů vnitřních, v takové, může, můžeme říct si, vnitřní krize. Těžce nesl, že jeho přátelé a lidé, kterým on věřil, se kterým on pracoval, najednou museli z ministerstva odejít zcela bezdůvodně, jenom vyloženě se stranicko-politických důvodů. To myslím, že byl faktor, který na něj zvlášť silně působil. Willem Mischin described to me how the action committees took over the foreign ministry and how Jan reacted. Tam se vznikly takzvané akční trojky. Akční trojka to byl jeden vrátný a jedna posluhovačka a nevím, nějaký jeden řízenec. A ty rozhodovali o tom, kteří pracovníci půjdou z ministerstva vyhozený. A pan ministr bohužel tu výpověď jejich musel podepsat. A to byli někdy pracovníci, kteří u něj ještě sloužili v Londýně, a velvyslanci, který on dobře znal jako dobrý pracovníky a dobrý lidi, a teďka měl podepsat jejich, jejich výpověď. A z toho byl hrozně rozčelený, takže zkoušel šel, jak vymlouval se, že je nemocný, a aby se tomu vyhnul, ovšem bohužel to nešlo. Tam byl můj maminka. Within two weeks of the coup, Jan Masaryk was dead. At his graveside with Willem Vichin, I wondered about his last terrible moments on that night in March 1948. Just months before, Jan made his last speech to the United Nations. Please let the year 1948 be a great milestone for our Federation. We can shape our own future if we do it together, please. God bless and keep you. Truth shall conquer if we give it half a chance. I'll be seeing you.
For 40 years, Jan Musserk's name was erased from the history books and public records. The Musserk Society is now trying to correct this. Their members are petitioning for a statue in his honor to be unveiled outside the Chernin Palace, still the foreign ministry. I was here to talk with Antonin Soon, Jan Musserk's former secretary. Three days before his death, Jan had attended the anniversary celebrations of his father's birth. Mr. Soon recalled how distraught he had been. At this occasion, it was said um, that uh, the President Masaryk, the old president, would agree with everything what was going on during that time. That means that he would agree with the coup of the communists. It was absolutely impossible, absolutely uh, false. So that was the moment when John Masaryk was upset. So you see the, the anger in his eyes. Was my great-great-uncle so depressed he would consider suicide? Or were there more sinister forces at work? I decided to go carefully through his final days to try and uncover the truth about his death. Just days before, Jan Masaryk was shocked when his political ally, the Minister of Justice, tried and failed to commit suicide by leaping out of a window. He called it the act of a servant girl, messy and futile. The next day, he sent his American companion, the writer Marcia Davenport, out of the country to safety. He feared for her life and even his own. Politically powerless and personally isolated, the shadows were closing in. He was seemingly depressed at that time. And he said, well, there is some kind of danger everywhere around us. That is definite. Um, did he believe his life was in danger after the coup? Did he ever say anything? Mm. I think, uh, I think we were. Well, he, I he, had I the think feeling said, of the danger. But he said, oh, so I he said to, so to, to Marsha, he said, I am in mortal danger. But it was in the last days. Yes, after, after yes, February. February. After February. On his final day, Jan Masaryk attended an official reception for the new Polish ambassador at President Benesch's country villa. These are the last pictures of him alive. After the reception, Jan talked with his old ally, Edward Benesch. Gottwald was due to announce his new cabinet the next day. Musrik knew his position in it would be intolerable, but he still could not abandon the president. The ailing Benesch told Musrik to make his own decision. In these final hours, was he considering escape? <laughs> že by bylo nejlepší odletět do Londýna, kde ní, než zůstat zůstávat. A on mi na to řekl, odletět do Londýna, je odletět ze země a nic nedělat. To si jako Masaryk dovolit nemůžu. A odletět do ciziny a štvát proti vlastnímu náradu, i když toho času zblblímu, to si taky, to taky nemůžu. But according to his close friend in London, diplomat Sir Robert Bruce Lockhart, Jan Masaryk did plan to escape right up until the last moment. Robin Bruce Lockhart, now preparing a biography of Jan Masaryk, has studied his father's diaries. Well, my father had uh, two messages he received between February the 20th and March the 10th, 1948, of his plans to escape. Uh, one came from Marsha Davenport, uh, a lady friend of Jan Masryk, and the other was from a source which my father couldn't reveal for security reasons. 
and also that evidence was backed up by other senior members of the Benish government, i.e. associates of Masaryk's who were anti-communists who escaped to England and told my father that uh, he had made plans to escape. And my father even wrote that he said, I had no doubt that he intended to escape. As Jan said goodbye to the president for the last time, the moment of decision was drawing near. My family had told me his anxiety by now was taking a physical toll. He had insomnia combined with bronchitis. On his return from the country, Masar confided his fears to Antonin Soum. At one moment, he told me that uh, uh, he thinks that the best situation, that means the communist rule, would uh, go on for a long, long time. Well, I was a little bit naive, most probably, at the time, and I replied, well, Mr. Minister, I suppose that uh, our Western uh, friends would help us too. But he shook his hand, his head, and he said, I don't think so. You would most probably survive, but not me, said Jan Masaryk. Later that afternoon, Jan retired to bed. There, he worked on a speech for the Polish-Czechoslovak friendship celebrations the following day. The last people to see Jan Masaryk alive were his housekeeper and butler. Both testified everything seemed normal. He dismissed them at approximately 8.30 that evening. He said he would see them tomorrow morning as usual. Jan's behavior gave no hint he planned to take his own life. What happened after that remains a mystery. Police photographs taken at the scene of Jan's death offer me few clues. The disorder in which his apartment was found leave more unanswered questions. A bottle of powerful sleeping pills was beside his bed, untouched. The bathroom was in chaos. Broken glass and razor blades were all over the floor. A pillow was found in the bathtub, the window frame smeared with his excrement a product of mortal fear. How can this evidence be explained? I tried to imagine how Jan Masaryk behaved under the pressure of those last days. Could he have woken in despair, determined to take his own life? of Jan Masaryk's death sent shockwaves around the world. The Gottwald government announced an official verdict of suicide, brought on by criticism from the West. My family was horrified, uncertain what to believe. At the United Nations the next day, 
Czechoslovakia's delegate voiced his disbelief and demanded an independent inquiry into the coup. I know Jan's friends abroad doubted he had taken his own life. Well, you know, I was, of course, deeply shocked by his death, by the way it happened, and uh, I did not believe that uh, he committed suicide. And I had various reasons for that. One, for instance, is that he, I knew, was afraid of pain. And jumping out of a window and uh, expecting to hit uh, the stone, stony ground obviously would have meant infinite pains for him, if, unless, you know, you die instantly. But if he had wanted to commit suicide, I think he would have taken an overdose of sleeping pills instead. So I'm convinced that he was murdered. The communist leadership stood by the official version. However, two senior politicians, one a former prime minister, privately did not believe it. Sám mám určité pochybnosti a sice z těch informací, které jsem získal o něm, od Kopeckého, od Firlingera z celého jeho životopisu a z celého jeho chování Masaryka vyplývalo, že, že nemohli ani oni najít cestu, jak je to možný, že, se, že, se to, že si to udělal. I discovered that many of the doubts stem from the original police investigation of 1948. When the body was found in the courtyard of the Chernin Palace, the criminal police were called in. But almost immediately, state security agents took over the investigation. Just six hours later, they delivered the verdict of suicide. <laughs> specialistí, kterým to bylo odebráno a dostali to, dostala to státní bezpečnost, která v tom neměla žádný zkušenosti ani praxi. V tom byla ta základní chyba celý, celého případu Masaryka. To znamená, že oni to nevyšetřili, že oni to všetřili jenom politicky a tak, for nearly 20 years, my family and many others questioned the verdict. Publicly, they could say nothing. In 1968, during the brief period of freedom known as the Prague Spring, rumors that Jan had been murdered resurfaced. Yuchi Kotlash, then the general prosecutor, was appointed by the new leadership to reopen the Masaryk case. I was told that his investigation had been the most thorough so far. Dr. Kotlash, um, what conclusions did your investigation reach? We have on the beginning of our work established, like in every case of investigation or investigation, three versions. Is it a crime, a crime, or a crime? This is the basic principle of every work in the field of criminal criminalistic. K tomu směřovali všechny úkony, aby se buď jedna z těch verzí potvrdila a ostatní vyloučili, anebo abychom zjistili prostě, která z nich je objektivně existující. My jsme v době, kdy já jsem odcházel z prokuratury, kdy teda už to bylo těsně před skončením, ale tak mohu říct, že jsme nezjistili žádné skutečnosti, které by nasvědčovali tomu, že byl spáchán trestný čin. To znamená, že jsme v podstatě teda těmi vyšetřovacími úkony, které jsme prováděli, mohli vyloučit všechny skutečnosti, které tu verzi, že šlo o vraždu. The investigation was stopped in 1969. Jiří Kotláš was dismissed and never worked as general prosecutor again. He showed me the Masaryk files, still marked secret and locked away in this dusty prison cell. Mm -hmm. 
Cutlodge's investigation was unable to prove suicide. Suspicions that Jan was murdered persisted. I still have questions about the clues left behind in his apartment. Could the evidence be explained if intruders entered the Chernin Palace that night? If it was murder, who had something to gain? The Czechoslovak communists needed him. But what about the Soviets? Stalin had removed many opponents by murder disguised as suicide. Jan's death would be a brutal lesson to the Czechoslovak people that there was now a new order. Stalin could not risk Jan, in exile, becoming a dangerous focus for opposition to the regime. I think that the only people who would have profited from this were the Russians. They, they couldn't keep a foreign minister a prisoner in Prague. I mean, he had to go to, to, to the United Nations at the sessions and uh, to, to some international conferences. And if he would have uh, jumped off the wagon, it would have uh, been, to say the least, uh, very unpleasant for the Russians. Besides, there is no doubt that he knew a few things about the Russians that he was not supposed to know. In the months of speculation that followed, allegations of murder recurred against one man, Augustine Schramm, a known Russian agent and wartime partisan. Well, the only person whose name would mention in my father's diaries as possibly uh, being responsible for his murder was a, a major Shram who was supposed to be working partly for the NKVD. Uh, he heard this, my father, from uh, a major Mastny who'd been uh, working in Czechoslovakia as a partisan and he saw my father after his escape from Czechoslovakia and, and my father's diaries indicate what he called a long chain of evidence that Shram was the guilty party. Toto tvrzení zcela jednoznačně se vyvrátilo v výpovědi tehdejšího zprávce ubytovny v Panenských Břežanech, panem Pokorným, který prohlásil, a bylo to uvěřeno ještě z jiných míst, že v kritickou dobu byl major Šram v těchto Panenských Břežanech a nevzdálil se o tamto. Schramm himself was mysteriously killed two months after Masaryk's death. Was this an act of revenge, or was he silenced because he knew too much? A young man, accused of being a Western agent, Miroslav Chotz, was convicted and executed for Schramm's murder. He is now known to have been innocent. Was he also killed to cover up the truth? Rudolf Barak hints that even more people were involved in Masaryk's death. Jestli to byla americká rozvědka, ang ang anglická nebo, nebo ruská, to nemůžu potvrdit. Já jenom jsem zjišťoval, protože jsem tady měl poradců hromadu sovětských generálů, tak jsem jenom zjišťoval i jejich takový ty stanoviska. Ale oni tvrdili to, co teď říkal jsem já, že to byla hra rozvědek a že těžko Podle toho všeho to byla saba, sema, sebevražda. Controversial new evidence has recently emerged. In 1990, a copy of a suicide note allegedly written by my great-great-uncle was found in the Communist Party archives. 
typed and addressed to Stalin, it pleaded with the Soviet leader to stop his intervention in Czechoslovakia. The letter quoted Thomas Musrick and concluded by saying, I cannot live without freedom or die unnoticed. The suicide note was published by Rude Pravo, the former Communist Party newspaper, now anxious to establish new credibility. I asked the journalist responsible if he believed it was genuine. Potom je nutno přemýšlet, kdo mohl mít zájem na tom, aby takový dopis existoval, pokud by to teda mělo být falzum. Samozřejmě jedině dezinformační služby, a to ať už teda STB, naše, Československá, tajná služba, anebo KGB. Jenomže tehdy použít bych nemohl, tak proto mě jaksi v hlavě není jasno, proč by KGB vytvářela takovýto dokument, který tehdejší moc nemohla použít. Jo, nemohla ho prostě použít, protože je proti tehdejší moci. Takže já se domnívám, že pravděpodobně i je to dopis, který buď psal Masaryk sám, anebo mu někdo k tomu třeba pomáhá, některý ho tajemník nebo novinář, těžko říct. Proč by měl psát e, Stalinovi, proč by měl psát ty věci, které, které v tom článku byly uvedeny, proč by je měly být takhle formulovány, proč by měl vkládat do úst svému otci ta vyjádření, která v tomto článku, v tomto dopise údajně, já nevím, Masarykem napsaným, by měl pan prezident Masaryk takto formulovat. Já to pokládám celé za velice nevěrohodné. Another dead end. If the suicide note was an elaborate fake, it goes no further in establishing the truth. I hope that those who knew Jan best could shed some light on how he died. We have no specific knowledge. So, you know, we, we can't have doubts because we have no knowledge. And it's difficult in a case like this to point your finger at somebody because you have to be sure. It's too serious question. So, he must left, he can't he, say it. He must have lived a terrible day before he died. That is the only in, thing. Yes. However it happened. If it happened this way or that way, yeah. it must have been a terrible time for him. That's perfectly true. My grandmother recalls Jan's distress. His friends remember a man driven to the brink by overwhelming pressures. But did this finally force him over the edge? We were quite sure that it was his own will because he wanted to manifest something. That was his idea, to show to the people, his people, Czech, Slovak people, and to the world that this communist rule is not in accordance with his personal views. He does, do not, uh, doesn't like it. He's opposed to that. It was his idea. Uh, I can't believe that he committed suicide uh, as, a, as a plan, so to say, carefully prepared. I think that uh, this is so contradictory to his whole character that I cannot believe that he committed suicide. As I watch footage of Jan's funeral, I remember my mother's stories of that tragic day. Gutwald and other senior communists had also attended to pay their respects. It was the last time they would praise the Masaryk name. That's mom, that's mom. Where? Did you see that? That, one, that little girl's mom. Jan's death did not prevent a new dark age for Czechoslovakia. He was simply its first victim. Dneska přesně nevím. Můj názor je na to tak, takový. Ať to byla vražda, nebo ať to byla sebevražda. V každém případě to byla politická vražda, politická sebevražda. Politicky motivovaná. A myslím si, že někdy politická sebevražda je horší než politická vražda. In Wenceslas Square, 
Jan Masaryk now takes his place alongside the other victims of communism. Although I had not solved the mystery of his death, I discovered something more important. Even after 40 years of lies and deception, Czechoslovaks cannot forget Jan and what he stood for. He has been a symbol of freedom, of a political ideal ruthlessly extinguished. Now that democracy has returned, perhaps, as Jan believed, truth can conquer if we give it half a chance.